the people who came at, at the first, uh, during the 1890s and early part of the century, were mainly families, uh, maybe young people who uh, were just married, but often uh, older people with families. After the First World War, that, then it became more or less an inundation of young men. And um, yeah, they, most of them were in their 20s, some in their teens. These people who came were uh, at the age where they were looking for a better life in earnest. And often they didn't find it here because the 20s and 30s weren't very kind. M most of them found hard times. Uh, it's very difficult to come to a new country unless you have work. In those days, unless you had work, there was no social assistance, no nothing. You had to have family, you had to have friends, or you simply starved. There was nothing. If you didn't have money, you didn't eat. It was as simple as that. Yeah, the Viking. Well, they traveled because they, they, they what happened in the, oh, I guess in the 1800s, early 1800s, things weren't so good over there, and and uh, there were a lot of small farms, small, small farms. The oldest boy always got the farm, and the other brothers would have to work for him, build, build little homes for himself, but work for him, see? So there was not much of a future. So they, well, Norway has been a tremendous nation at sea for so long, and they started sailing. And my God, there was an awful, awful Norwegian at sea. And then in 150 years ago, the immigration began. And he, uh, my so-called uncle, insisted I come to Canada. My mother had never heard of it, but the fact that she had, there were people here that knew me, she agreed to it. The, uh, the first idea was that my teacher wanted me to go to military college, but mother wouldn't hear of it. So she thought, you're better off going to Canada. So that's how it started. So I did well the first year or so, very well, because I got carpenter wages and everything working steady. I borrowed a bit of money from my grandfather and I sent it back long before it was due. It's been, it's very obvious that this part of the country looks very much like um, the old country. The uh, lakes, the rocks, the trees, it's, it's just very much like the old country. But uh, this, this part of the country is, in many ways in the wintertime, better than the old country because there's more light. It was a nice area. There was, here and there, there was good farmland, and there was, uh, there was lots of space, something they didn't have in the old country. There was lots of wildlife. There was, uh, there was logging. That was really something. You could just harvest. You didn't have to plant. My dad around 1930, I think briefly in 29, uh, left in 30, went west for a year or two. and. Uh, you know, worked in the West, went to BC, worked here and there, came back to Pass Lake, settled down about 31, uh, married in 32, sort of a little bit mail order type of, from, uh, my mother came from Denmark too. I believe it was mostly for adventure. Young, um, that time in the old country, things weren't really super booming, and they're just sort of the attraction of adventure. He'd read a whole lot of uh, Zane Grey novels. They came out at that time, and they were translated into uh, uh, Danish, and he worked in a bookstore, and every time a new book come, he'd read it, and he, it was somewhat the Wild West or whatever. He, he did check out the West, though, the Canadian West, but uh, he liked the bush more. Another thing, actually, is that like the Danes that emigrated, they weren't just average people, because if they were just average, they would have stayed in Denmark. They, they all had, they were 
they were a little special. You know, they were adventure or the lure of getting rich quick or some of them may even have some kind of past that they wanted to get away from or, you know, opportunity. Yes, my, my dad came from Nordingrå, uh, Sweden, and my mother came from uh, Stromfersbruk in Finland. And they met in Fort William. Uh, my dad came one year earlier than her, and they got married, and um, they were in 1914. Yeah, 1914, dear, wasn't it? No, 1914, they no, got married. No, they didn't. <laughs> Because they argued oh. 13. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. August the 19th. Well, anyway, he, he, he was a carpenter by trade and a millwright, but I think the times were, were pretty oh, hard in, uh, in both Finland and Sweden at yeah. the time. And, uh, and I suppose they were, they were yeah. Canada was looking for immigrants, and uh, they thought it was nice and rosy, I suppose, yeah. when they had a newspaper, I suppose. And well, my dad, uh, he was 16 when he came, and I guess it, times were poor, and there you go. Well, he was going to come with his two brothers, but they didn't allow them to come. But my dad came alone, and he was 16 years old. Yeah, it's sure that's something where I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, I haven't got the chance either. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. My mother came because my uh, uncle uh, was here already, and uh, but when they came, they couldn't speak a word of English. And then they had to find a job immediately, and you learned on the job. There was no, uh, no two ways about it. You didn't learn in school. You just did whatever. Well, my dad, he was out quite a bit. Uh, you know, he, well, he cut the pulp in the, in the, in the wintertime, and we hauled it to the CNR station at the flat. And I remember it, it took 16 cords to fill that boxcar. And uh, 75 bucks he got when, uh, when he got his money. It was hard. It was a really hard time, you know. And, but he, he cleared uh, 60 acres, and now it was all in trees, you know. Well, my dad built that in 1935. Uh, well, it has stayed up very well. It had a shingle roof, homemade shingles, you know. And, uh, but then uh, now finally we put that there, corrugated uh, sheeting on it. My dad made that paint. He bought the red ochre, and he had, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was white lead and uh, whatever else they uh, probably, um, what would you call that? Linseed oil. Yeah, linseed oil, and he uh, painted that, and it's only been painted once, and that's, uh, that is the original. Of course, it's getting pretty worn looking now, but, yeah. yeah. The Scandinavian Home Society was founded in 1923 to take care of some of these immigrants who came here expecting great things and what they found was no jobs. There was no place for them to go. They didn't know the language. They didn't know where to stay. They didn't know how to get enough food to eat. This place is actually a social welfare center and it was founded as such. It was a social center. They had a library. Most uh, Scandinavian people knew how to read. Um, there were newspapers so they could look for jobs. There were other people who came here um, who would say, oh, well, so-and-so is moving from this rooming house. They'll have room there for one person, and maybe you could get a room there. This place offered a haven, and that's why it's called the Scandinavian home. It offered the kind of support that you would get in your home. What cost 15 cents in those days? In the dirty 30s, they, they lowered it to 10 cents. A cup of coffee and four great big buns or, or uh, cookies. It, it was almost a meal. When I was a young girl, I was told to avoid this place. The reason I was told to avoid this place was because most of the people who came here were men. They were men who worked in the bush very often. They were they came in in the spring from the bush and they were on a tear. <laughs> they had cabin fever. They, they had 
um, they chewed snooze. They did unladylike things. They spit on the sidewalk and left great oysters there. I had to pick my way <laughs> along the sidewalk. <laughs> it was um, it was a place where the men wore hobnailed boots and the men were men and. Uh, it wasn't a place for a young girl. I was told to stay away. The Hoito was, the Finnish immigrants had a much different background than the ones from Sweden because of its geographical position between Russia and Sweden. Finland was quite politically involved and there was a lot of politics going on in Finland. So the people who came here were heavily involved in politics. The um, Hoito was founded much earlier than this, about 10 years earlier, and it, it, uh, it provided a similar function, but with political overtones. It was obviously a focal point in Port Arthur. I mean, uh, the, the building within which the Hoito is housed was built in 1910. Uh, by two, a uh, combination of two groups of people, a temperance society and uh, a socialist uh, society. And uh, basically it enabled them to get a hall where they could have theatrical presentations, they could have a meeting place, they even could have, uh, uh, they eventually set up the Hoito restaurant, which originally was a cooperative restaurant and uh, for many, many years ran as a cooperative and its only purpose was to provide the cheapest possible meals for people who happen to drop in there. So, uh, so it, has, uh, it has had an impact. Mind you, when I came to Canada, there were a number of Finns who sort of, I was told too by people who I uh, was acquainted with originally in Port Arthur is that you should stay away from that area because uh, some people thought that there was pro political turmoil on Bay Street. For the settlers, it was undoubtedly tough, but they were pretty tough people. They carved out the forest out there, and most of them ended up on soil that wasn't very good. <laughs> you know? But it just happened that it was surveyed, so that's what they got. Actually, it's sloppy. <laughs> and I, I was, when I begin to remember, it was already a settled community. All the farms were settled. And, uh, but they came, and it was called Luffy, if you're interested in that, uh, because uh, the, um, there, was already, there were already farmers at Kivikoski, and these guys were going further north, and for the Finns, Luffy is Flapland. So that's why it began to be called. At least that's the story my father told me. Well, um, I think mo like most uh, immigrants, I think that they were looking for a better life. I, my father, I know, was looking for land and, uh, because his home had been, um, his, um, his father had lost the farm and so he had no, um, he was just a hired man and, or was uh, working somewhere and he just wanted to, I imagine that's what it was, he wanted to find well, it was the land, mostly, because he was very content with that when he was farming. This is a long poem that, I've, I, uh, that um, I've been working on for a long, long time. And I'm going to just read bits and pieces out of it. Uh, I hope it'll make sense. And it's an attempt to, to give a picture of the, this early, the, of the early settlers and their memories and their acceptance of their lot or non-acceptance and so on. This is uh, my father's. I came for land. I heard there was free land here. Now I'm rooted in this alien soil, roots grown in secret. I've hardly noticed when. Yet, yet many generations of my father, my father's tilled that piece of earth near the river Voxi, earth that my father lost. It still holds me with strings of living tissue. My father was a poet, even though he never wrote a line. Once he scolded me for driving nails into a tree. I felt as if I'd broken real flesh in my thoughtlessness. He grew dahlias and scarlet runners, redundancies on a shield farmstead. He never forgot that at seven years he had to leave his childhood home. I never felt when I was young that I was inferior because I was a woman. 
uh, they were, there was a saying uh, that if, uh, uh, if the um, man was left alone, he was, he was pretty well helpless, but if a woman was left alone, she could carry on. Uh, it was just an old uh, uh, saying that I remember. And they were very important at the, uh, in that community. I tried to, um, to express my admiration for the women of the community because I think they were really, as I've said before, important. Strong arms, midwife, calves, breast nurture babies, hips sway to building brush piles, burning new clearings, shoulders heave with hoe and rake, able hands shape loaves, voices ring, confident in evening kitchens and public meetings, and in my head, and in my head. Coming here and finding life so difficult, it was just another phase in their lives, and they found fun where they found it. And they found a lot of fun in their music, and in their culture, and in the little things that make life worthwhile, the relationships with each other. It wasn't all fun and games, but they did the best they could. <laughs> Another time, you know, I was over here, and, and uh, we had to go to camp to get the mail, and uh, her dad had, uh, it was like a Bennett sleigh, Well, eh? you know, they used to oh, have those Bennett body, wagons. Yeah. Well, my dad yeah. made one out of a car body and put it on the sleigh, and yeah. we had this single horse, old, old Bessie. Bessie yeah. <laughs> and we went down, and it, it's eight miles to Kamenistaqua to the to the post office. Yeah, and well, we're riding yeah. along, you know, we were courting, so we were close together. And then we noticed a car behind us. Too bad we didn't have a, a rear view mirror. We <laughs> would have known before. Here what? he's going slowly behind old Bessie. Bessie went slow when it was, uh, going you know, up. going away from home. <laughs> yeah. Well, then we pulled over and let the car go. But uh, I guess they had a view, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> You don't hear much about Nordic immigrants, except for, for Finnish, uh, because they just wanted to assimilate. Just quiet people wanted to live their life and uh, just have a better life and have the social things, love music, love uh, crafts, loved uh, working hard. It's, uh, they just wanted to live. And uh, this, of course, affected the second generation because um, in almost every case, the first generation did not pass along the culture. So the second generation lost the language and much of the culture. I think in, for a lot of, of people that came from, from Europe, and especially with my father, uh, the most important thing if you were going to be a Canadian was to be a Canadian. And you shouldn't uh, dwell on the old country language or the old country tradition. The end result was that I didn't really know that uh, much about Norway. And uh, I think uh, it wasn't until till, uh, later on that I uh, started to get interested. My daughter brought me a book home uh, from the library on uh, Norwegian art. And it had some wood carvings in it, so I decided I'd do the, the, uh, a couple of the wood carvings. Even after that, I didn't realize that there was something called uh, acanthus carving, which is traditionally a, and uh, very Norwegian art in, in its uh, shape and form. I, I think it kind of tells you something about Norwegians. I think they're all a little uh, crazy. Uh, they want to do things in the most difficult way possible. Instead of carving something so that it is round, they carve it uh, with flat planes and then make it look like it's round. It's, it's called a stabur, and a stabur uh, is, is, is simply a hut with a loft. And basically, uh, the idea there, I would think that uh, in a country like Norway, you have very little land. So rather than building three or four sheds, they would build a shed on top of a shed. I guess uh, part of my interest in, in, in looking for my roots is to, is to find those things that, and those answers to those questions that exist in a person's mind. Where are you from and what are you and 
who are you, and so on. And, and uh, I, I've been uh, uh, looking at my uh, roots through genealogy as well, and uh, that's great fun as well, and being a, an old history teacher. I was always interested in the Scandinavian culture, uh, but it was years that uh, ago my grandparents passed away. And then about t 12 years ago I became very interested and we formed a little group and we were fortunate enough to find Scandinavian people here who would help us. And that's really how I got involved. It really makes me feel whole as a person. I really, really do. it. My roots are really important to me and just to know the struggles they went through and where they're from, how they lived over there, and on and I could just, and just to do their work, I have feeling in uh, my work, and it just really makes me feel whole. We didn't have a lot of it in our on our home, but I've always been interested in embroidery. We had embroidery in our home, but you remember my grandparents passed away when I was a little girl, so there wasn't any. But there must have been a, a longing, and when I saw this type of embroidery, I just loved it. It's what around the hand, under back, tighten up, pull it up like this, and then over, tighten up, and pull it again. And there's your knot. And you just do this series of knots and spaces, and you've got your tatting. Little knots that I've just shown you how to do with the little picots in between, which are just spaces between the knots. And it's just the way that you do them and tie them that you end up with this. My husband had gone ahead of me here. He was here six months before me and uh, wanted me to come over. So I um, brought my children and took off for Canada. I'm doing something called rose modeling in Norwegian. In English, that means rose painting. It's a very old craft. Since uh, 1700, they started this in Norway. Uh, the reason for this, I think, was those days they had in their houses just an open fireplace, so uh, the inside of the building got pretty dark and sooty, and uh, they will paint uh, their furniture and, uh, and some of the ceiling. And, and this was mostly with the uh, people that had, uh, was well, well off. They had oil and somehow they must have ground up, uh, whatever, dried up roots and bark and, and get the different colors that they would do at that time. Uh, I need relaxation for one thing. And uh, when you get good at it, you can, good at doing it, you can make so pretty nice things, you know. When I was young, I my father introduced me to skis. Now, they were just plain skis with a leather strap, but he had his with the sugar cube tips, and we always went to get the Christmas tree on skis. I never realized as a youngster that uh, Nordic people had brought skiing to this country. Um, I think that's quite a, a feat. We, we always skied a lot. Even as kids, we skied. We had to ski because there's three feet of snow and you had to get to school. And if it was the only way of getting there. Sometimes in the winter, the roads weren't even plowed. They were $1.69 a pair. They had no harness on them. You made your harness yourself. They were made out of wood, you know, maple. My parents, I don't think they had ever skied in Denmark. But they, they both skied. They almost had to have skis in the old days. I can remember the, some of the first years. I can remember the winter of 38. And there was so much snow that just the tops of the fence posts stuck through. And uh, you simply had to ski. I remember the first pair of skis that uh, I had. Uh, they were about three feet long. Uh, walnut, I, th I, I think they were certainly walnut color, but maybe not walnut wood, maybe something else. The thing that was peculiar about those little skis and at the front, there was always a little wooden tip about that size. And it was always called a sugar bite. Because in those days, the Scandinavians in particular loved to have their coffee with a little, a little cube of sugar. And uh, they were called sugar bites. You know, my dad, he 
we bought eggs uh, for the incubator from uh, her, her dad, you know. And he come here on skis, imagine. And he'd get 30 dozens in a crate and, and, and he had it on his back. And, and he'd ski home to my place across the bush, you know. And uh, we had an incubator in, in the living room. And uh, he's, That's you, you lay all these eggs, I think it was 500 eggs, I think it is, or 450, yeah. whatever it is. And then you had to go with an ink pencil and you, you marked all the eggs. And then twice a day, you turn, morning and night, you turn this, this egg, you know, and you Just had, like the hand does. Yeah. <laughs> and first time we, the, those, uh, those chicks start hatching, you know, and my sister Anne there, you know, she went in there and she was opening up these shells so she could hear that, <laughs> you know, the head coming out, you know, and <laughs> my dad caught her and said, told her that, you, you, should, you know, you shouldn't do that, you know. <laughs> now we better stop talking. <laughs> And I, I was 19 and a half and I left, so I guess I had jumped there for 10 years maybe or something. Uh, but coming to Canada, I, I think there was no more of it until I got to Bainmore. <laughs> After I had been in, at the mine for about two or three years, we, uh, we had an association among the families. We put, I forget, about 25 cents a month or something, so for picnics, etc. And the first project was to build a skating rink. Well, that come to more mother than we expected, but we were a lot of working on it. Then the, on the north side of this hill was the, of this skating rink was a hill. And Harold, a friend of mine, Harold Ramsted, a friend of mine, we had jumped together in the old country. So we got the wish that we had a jump there. And uh, they, we were used to working on natural hillside, the inland and everything. We just built up a take off with snow and uh, spruce, spruce branches and stuff. But here we had to build up something, and that was the problem. But uh, there was a company by the name of Tansley in nearby that was cutting props for the mine. And they had a big pile of slabs out there. Uh, we, we looked at that, and boy, that would be nice to go uphill with. But the problem was we needed some two by fours and four by fours, etc. And Tantley said, I can't give you any of them, but you can have the slabs all you want. So anyway, we talked about this, and we thought, well, better go and see the manager, super manager. He was an American. Oh, this, you know, he looked at us, you know, and uh, he had never seen a ski jump before. So he said, uh, what do you mean, you're going to jump on skis? I said, oh, yeah. Have you done it before? Oh, yes. But uh, he said, we, we, we need this braces and, uh, and, and stuff for the takeoff. So we looked at us and he said, no. If you were crazy enough to take off from that thing, I'm crazy enough to give you the lumber. <laughs> so we worked, any time we had off, we worked up there and we got it finished. And we were going to get the first jumping off on a Sunday. And I think the whole town side was up there, you know, a real spectacle. And we, we started jumping. It did pretty well, too. And uh, it was quite good, unfortunately. In 1942, the mine closed down, so that was the end of that. In, in the city here, they, were, they had ski, a ski club. They, uh, they had the Portage Ski Club, and they jumped on Strat Corner on the golf course before they moved to Mont Baldy. And they, in Fort William, of course, they, they started in 1907, but there was a, a doldrum for a while it, until the Hansen boys came. Then it uh, sparkled up again. There was an earlier jump on the, what we know now as the Strathona Golf Course. And that was the, uh, 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 pardon the expression, that was the Port Arthur people. Yes, Oost and all those, uh, uh, and all those old timers. They, they had a jump hill there sometime before the Hawks Farm thing. But then the, um, the Hanson, brothers came into it and of course they, they had been taught ski jumping in Norway when you know before they came over and um, 
When we opened up the Fort William jump, we had uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 35 to 40 jumpers. I, I know that sounds almost impossible, but we did. Bringing the Americans up here was absolutely a treat because they only knew jumping. But we thought, well, we could have some fun and, uh, and make a slalom and downhill thing with the jumping. And then we had to have people on every gate because they would come down and clean out all the gates. But they were great jumpers. And of course, between Brother Canute and, and the Americans, um, the um, cars were lined up from the Jackknife Bridge right out to the Fort Mesquite Club. It was, uh, it was a fantastic thing. They would announce things like, um, there's a youngster from Francis Street School going to jump off Mount McKay. This, <laughs> this is how they, they put it back when I was. We were going to jump off Mount McKay. Um, they, they just could not get over this uh, ski jumping. When we used to jump, um, we used to jump with rubber boots. And we used to tie the skis on. With, 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 we, with, uh, you might say we were very daring <laughs> back in those days. Uh, there was a gentleman here by the name of H.H. H. Richards. Now, that was the, it was his invention that was the birth of the bindings that we know today. It, it um, was fantastic. But what he had to do was uh, have a shoemaker build the square toe boot so that it would fit into the irons that he made. And then he had a front take up, bang, we just on a spring. And then he had uh, just an ordinary a uh, very hard rope first that went underneath to give you down pull. You know, very simple, <laughs> very plain. Uh, to make a, a long story short, it was Dodds who bought the patent from H.H. H. Richards, and, and, and that was the advent of, of the binding we know today. Anyway, the shoe <laughs> that he had uh, made for, for this occasion. Uh, H.H. Uh, H. Richard camped at, um, at uh, Loon, uh, not at Loon, at, at Silver Island. And uh, of course, he used these boots for fishing. And of course, uh, they would got wet and they would be dried out. They got wet and they would be dried out. Finally, uh, we had a chap that was jumping and um, he, um, he, wanted to, he wanted to learn the art of jumping so bad. It, and one day he came upon the scene, <laughs> and H.H. H. had given uh, this chap, his name was Harry McIntyre, had given these boots to Harry. And Harry was just, no one had anything like it. it you know, it was just, well, that particular year, we had all oh, a tremendous amount of snow. And um, uh, Harry had uh, taken the harness off old H.H. H., shoes and, and actually had mounted them on a pair of uh, back nose here. We just had two grooves uh, on our jumping skis. And it was Harry's, <laughs> it was Harry's turn to jump. And um, he, um, he, had, he came off the takeoff. He was perfect. It would have been a perfect jump, but one ski flew this way and one ski flew. This was in flight. The soles stayed on in, into that binding that he had made. Had, had he been using what we were using, it wouldn't have happened. But it was a fact that uh, th these uh, ski boots had been so dried that when Harry came off the takeoff, he just came, the, <laughs> the, the, the top part of the boot pulled off the sole and, and all that was left was the sole was still embedded in the ski and, and, and Harry was, uh, he was running like a, like a Disney uh, cartoon through the air, you know. One of my brothers, um, Erling, a uh, very quiet chap, um, started to laugh, and he was on the knoll of the, of the hill, and, and he, he laughed so hard, uh, he rolled all the way down the, the outrun of the jump hill. It was, it was a sight that, it was absolutely, Unbelievable. It isn't um, just how far down the hill you can jump. It is uh, all the things that make up the art of, of, uh, 
of, of flying, and that's exactly what it is. It, it's the art of flying, and it's, um, it's a wonderful experience, just super, yeah. Well, um, like most uh, kids from Scandinavian families, that was about the first thing you did after you started walking. Um, it, it wasn't the gravity skiing variety, the downhill skiing. It was um, uh, going from point A to point B, and this was a neat way to get there because uh, it didn't involve that much effort. So I, I had my first pair of skis, I think, about five years of age. In Scandinavia, I'm well aware that uh, there are loppets all over you can compete in, and a lot of the population skis. And to them, it's, uh, it's as about as much as hockey is to us here. And in fact, uh, one of the big highlights of my skiing was, was going over to ski the Swedish Vasa loppet and uh, being in a crowd of over 10,000 going 90 kilometers was quite an experience. Uh, it took me seven hours and 50 minutes, <laughs> which isn't moving very fast, but it was fast enough to not being uh, knocked out of the race because if you reach the various checkpoints at too slow a time, you wind up uh, being withdrawn for skiing too slowly. And actually, I had beaten the current King of Sweden's time by a bit when he had done the race, I felt kind of good about that. <laughs> there's, there's a few more aches and pains. In fact, uh, sometimes uh, uh, training and, uh, and workouts are a matter of pain management. But uh, I don't think I declined all that much. And besides, the, the, the competitions that I go in are age categories uh, usually only uh, five years apart. So there are categories geared for skiers right up to, to 80 and over. So you're, the, the competition's a little more realistic that you're not looking to win an event, you're looking to see how well you can do against people of, of your age group. The old skis, you, you pine tarred them, and then you, you, if, if you put on any kick wax, I, I have one, uh, I have one here called uh, High Speed Ski Wax, all snow. And I'm not sure how old this is. I think it's my father's vintage. It says uh, wax for ascending and descending. <laughs> you, uh, you, you put it on thick if you want to go up the hill, and you smooth it out if you want to go down the hill. And on the flats, I guess, whatever you feel is good for both kicking and gliding. The sport is changing. It's, it's uh, getting very sophisticated. I mean, I'm, I'm left behind by 15 years now. I mean, when we skied in the mid-70s, early 70s, uh, competition uh, waxing uh, skis, uh, uh, a lot of things were a lot more simpler those days. Um, trail conditions were nowhere near the standards that they are today. The machinery wasn't there. We skied in competition trails those days. Uh, there was no machinery. To, to do it like we have today. Uh, had one pair of skis, two pairs maximum. Today, we may have people come to Nordics uh, with 25, 35, 45 pairs of skis because you have a pair of skis for every different conditions. And, and of course, waxing has become, uh, you almost have to be a, a chemist nowadays to, uh, to, to know everything about waxing. So it has, it has gone ahead just like everything else in the world. Today, we're skiing 50 kilometers in an hour and 50 minutes. Uh, 20 years ago, the winning times were two and a half hours. Uh, 30 to 40 years ago, they were three and a half hours. It's a tough sport. When you're, when you're training at, at the uh, maximum uh, hours that the top international athletes train, uh, they may do 10,000 to 12,000 kilometers on foot a year, uh, have it been roller skiing, uh, running, uh, skiing itself. It's a high to compete. I mean, you train to compete, and I was, 
I was never ever really good at training hard, I, but I loved to compete. Uh, if I could uh, put my boots on a line with the other guy and try to beat him, uh, I found uh, great enjoyment out of it. Uh, uh, and if you were able to improve in your own standards, uh, it also gave you a really good feeling. To me, it's more like uh, racing cars. I think that skiing has terrain. It has hill uphills, downhills, uphills make some people who are not in good shape struggle. <laughs> uh, downhills uh, uh, bring about certain kinds of challenges and some people fall. Uh, there's uh, snow conditions vary. There happened to be an incredible uh, announcer, a sports announcer in Finland for skiing. His name was Pekka Tilikainen. And um, I'm not exactly sure why we were so tuned into it, but everybody in the country paid attention to the competitions. And there used to be always a very serious competition between the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, for both ski jumping and cross-country skiing. They were broadcast live. And this fellow was able to describe he, uh, the jumping right to the finest detail. So you had an image in your mind of how the person flew, how they landed, not only simply how far, but just the form and whether or not they were steady. Same thing with cross-country skiing. He really built up the drama. He could tell whose wax was off and whose tongue was hanging out and uh, uh, all the fine details. So you really knew who was struggling and who was really skiing very well. And it was exciting. All of us as kids were on the edges of our seats listening to him. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was every bit as exciting as a hockey game and a Stanley Cup championship was to me. Like in the same way as people get excited, we yelling and hooting and hollering. Right now, it's so much television and sort of stardom is associated with sports. But I imagine uh, in Norway now, Bjorn Dali is every bit as uh, famous as uh, Wayne Gretzky is here in Canada. I think it's like any sport. If you understand it, if you can feel it, if you can sort of appreciate what somebody's going through, then you can uh, really get into observing it. Oh, I still ski several times a week, as many times a week as I can. <laughs> I like it. It just, uh, to me, I don't know, my daughter uh, uh, just started ski jumping, and she tells me the reason she, sta she started ski jumping was because she liked to fly. And sometimes I've also thought that skiing, no matter what form it takes, whether it's downhill skiing, whether it's jumping or cross-country skiing, it just seems to me human attempt to f uh, have uh, locomotion that's closer to flight than walking or running. And uh, I, when I used to be in better shape and younger, sometimes it felt like that too. I have a vision of legacy. I think the reason I'm involved in the Nordics is because of the legacy. I'm not really involved in there to be get close to big stars. I'm involved in it because of the aftermath. On one hand, you have a fairly significant, substantial community with a multicultural kind of uh, milieu and a couple of hops, skips, and jumps, and you are in the bush. And there ain't going to be anybody there bugging you. <laughs> I think that the, the best reason for the Nordic Championships is the legacy. Uh, one of the things I don't think many people realize that in many ways, Thunder Bay has a competitive advantage in cross-country skiing relative to a lot of other communities. This cross-country skiing here is probably as good as it is anywhere in North America in many ways. Well, I think people will come, and I th think that the Nordics will put a name on the map, and they will say, okay, in Thunder Bay, there's skiing, there's good skiing, let's go there. story about Oscar Stiff years ago uh, had come up from some place in Michigan and he wrote a letter back to his wife and said uh, mama you have to come up to Port Arthur uh, I found a place that's just like Norway snow is white and sky is blue and, and uh, skiing is good Vikings uh, and Nordic people are very close I like to travel, I like to go around the world, I like to try new things.